All right, you don't have to get loud with me. Welcome to Watch Mojo. And today we're counting down our picks for the top 10 SNL cast members who dropped off the map after leaving. Uh, you won't even know I'm here. Okay. For this list, we'll be looking at former cast members of the long-running variety series who just never found much success outside the show. Know any other not ready for primetime players who didn't quite live up to their potential? Let us know in the comments. Number 10, Luke Knoll. It generally takes a while for audiences to warm up to new SNL cast members, so that puts most one-season wonders at quite the disadvantage. Ouch, that hurt my feelings, but you can make it up to me by taking me to the movies on Friday. This certainly was the case for Luke Knoll. Hired as a featured player just before the start of the 43rd season, his exit didn't come as a surprise to dedicated fans of the show. We like to do things a little different around here. We sure do. Someone give us a beat. Anyone. I mean, I used to beatbox in college, but I don't know if I can still ever, ever. <laughs> Noel barely appeared in sketches, mostly being assigned background roles and having his standout material getting cut for time. Since leaving the show in 2018, Noel's career has pretty much mirrored his unfortunate run on SNL. He released a comedy album in 2019 where he poked fun at his premature dismissal from the great studio 8H, but hasn't done much else. Mark's gonna find us. He has no idea. Mark's gonna catch all three of us someday. Three? You, you me, and Jack. Who is Jack? Number nine, Peter Aykroyd. The exit of Dan Aykroyd and John Belushi by the end of the fourth season left a hole in the cast that showrunner Lorne Michaels quickly filled with relatively new faces, one of whom was the younger Aykroyd brother. Yeah, it was strange. I had no appetite. Just wanted coffee. Pure black coffee. Unlike Dan, Peter didn't make much of an appearance on the show, receiving a player credit on only six of his 16 total episodes. His career afterwards consisted of minor film roles and a worst screenplay Razzie nomination for Nothing But Trouble, which he co-wrote with his brother. Oh, I'd like to thank you for that little tip on the market you gave me. The wife says the stock's gone up five points. Good, Mike. Want some more, Brian? Sure. Sell it. Other than a Canadian sci-fi series he co-created in the late 90s called Sci Factor, sightings of Peter Aykroyd in the media were few and far between after his SNL stint. And sadly, Dan's younger brother passed away in November 2021. Sometimes the most extraordinary occurrences have the simplest explanations. Number 8. Tim Kazarinski It goes without saying that in the early 80s, SNL was the Eddie Murphy special. Live from New York, it's the Eddie Murphy show! The brilliant comedian dominated the show, overshadowing other talented cast members like Tim Kazarinski. Hired without even being auditioned, Kazarinski was a killer at celebrity impressions and played a host of other popular characters like Dr. Jack Badofsky and Madge the Monkey's husband. Why is it that whenever I confront you with anything like this, you say nothing? <laughs> he left SNL after three years, ready to take on Hollywood, and quickly landed the role of Carl Sweetchuck on the Police Academy film series. No, no, no. What do you want from me? Blood? Get out! Be cool, old man. This, he followed up with a bunch of minor roles in films and on TV, never quite attaining nearly the same level of fame as some of his former castmates. Number 7. Brooks Whelan Fired from New York, it's Saturday night! Those were the words that this fresh-faced comic from Cedar Rapids, Iowa used to announce his firing from the show after just one season. Something, is something wrong? Oh, no, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, nothing is wrong. Keep having your meeting. So the third quarter... Oh, my God! Something is wrong. Brooks Whelan was hired as a writer for the 39th season and then quickly added as a cast member mere days before the season premiere. What is the significance of a nautical star? Oh, interesting you should ask, because it means nothing, Seth. <laughs> this rush may have played a role in him not quite fitting with the rest of the cast, resulting in his early dismissal. He hit the road on a stand-up comedy tour shortly after and released a critically acclaimed comedy album in 2015, but has largely remained distant from the spotlight. It's not even my dad's fault that shocked me so much. I was not a tough little kid. Like, I had a Furby way too long. <laughs> like, a Furby is this weird robot hamster owl most girls my age had. 
Number six, John Milheiser. There are one season SNL cast members like Robert Downey Jr. and Sarah Silverman who went on to become household names. And then there are people like John Milheiser. Uh, look, man, I, I don't want any trouble, all right? Well, you found it. Six foot four, 250 pounds of it. Viper. That's me. Right. After performing with the Upright Citizens Brigade sketch teams in New York and Los Angeles, Milheiser was hired as a featured player on the 39th season, becoming only the second openly gay male cast member on the show. Because of you, sir, when I grow up, I want to be the man in my neighborhood who gives crack to kids. No, you don't, because that's called a drug dealer, okay? Although brilliant at physical comedy, his presence was hardly felt as he struggled to stand out among the already overpopulated cast. After being let go, Milheiser made guest appearances on TV shows, but sadly, none proved to be a breakout role. Oh well, at least dancing maniacally with Lady Gaga is a great claim to fame. Look at your Number five, Ellen Cleghorn. And he was all into it screaming, Whitney, Whitney, I hear music. I hear the drums of Africa calling me. And Whitney said, them ain't no drums, Kevin. That's my head banging up against the headboard. It's Queen Shaniqua, everybody. Ellen Cleghorn was instrumental in balancing the heavy masculine energy of SNL sketches in the early 90s. Over her four-year run, she performed several celebrity impressions and played memorable characters like Queen Shaniqua and Zoreta, the short-tempered NBC page. I wasn't getting loud with you. Uh, uh, no, 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 uh, no, 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 never mind, never mind. Hey, no, 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 that's how you better walk away from me, Joe Pesci, getting loud with me. Hey, Joe Pesci, what makes you think I won't caught you, huh? Cleghorn exited the show on a high note, going on to star in her own sitcom on the WB. The series was canceled after one season, and she quietly vanished from the mainstream media, only resurfacing years later to play a minor role in former castmate Adam Sandler's Grown Ups 2. What? With her sights now set on academia, Cleghorn received a PhD in performance studies from New York University's Tisch School of the Arts. Number four, Paul Britton. Lorne Michaels giveth and Lorne Michaels taketh away. <laughs> this veteran improv comedian was brought on for SNL's 36th season, alongside other well-known cast members like Vanessa Bayer and Taryn Killam. He quickly gained recognition on the show for his spot-on impressions and original characters, including Lord Cecil Windermere and sex ed Vincent, only to abruptly leave midway through his second season. Over the course of three days, you'll be treated to lectures covering a wide variety of topics, including gender roles, anatomical limits, cyber sex, and taboos. Britton took on a supporting role on the short-lived ABC sitcom Trophy Wife and on the 2017 film Killing Gunther directed by Taron Killam. He's pretty much disappeared since then, but it's highly likely he just needs a little more attention. Now you're pulling double duty at the Oscars, you're hosting and you're a nominee. Uh, that's not all uh, I'm doing at the Oscars. Uh, I'm also working the coat check room, uh, and I'm smelting all the award statues in my foundry. Really? Number three, Jay Farrow. It's a little tricky understanding how Jay Farrow went from being a breakout star in SNL to fading into the background after his departure. As Denzel Washington would say, Daniel Radcliffe. <laughs> My man. <laughs> yes, Denzel Washington is very good. I've seen that. The remarkable impressionist spent six seasons on the show playing a roster of celebrity impressions and knocking every single one of them out of the park. Probably most famous for his portrayal of Barack Obama, Farrow was strangely let go from the show in 2016, just as Obama's presidency was coming to an end. I've heard so many questions from the American people. Questions like, is this the first step towards war? What can the United States do? And hold up, what's crap man? He bagged regular roles on two series that both ended up getting canceled after one season and never quite landed the breakout role he so badly deserved. There are things about this dark, dreary industry yeah. that you do not need to know. That right. is why you pay me. You know what? I gotta go. I think I just gotta process all this shit. Number two, Lorraine Newman. 
One of the original not ready for primetime players, Lorraine Newman was a bright eyed 22 year old when she grabbed the attention of Lorne Michaels while performing as a founding member of the sketch comedy troupe, The Groundlings. And that's the way it is at the Blaine Hotel. Back to you, Chevy Chase. Admittedly not the best of improvisers, Newman carefully crafted her characters beforehand, performing several memorable ones during her five year stint on the show. Oh God, you should have learned to live with it by now, Bob. I mean. I've kind of come to look at sitting at the kitty table as kind of a lovely Thanksgiving tradition. In the 80s and 90s, she took on an array of supporting roles in comedy movies and series, then largely transitioned to voice acting at the turn of the new millennium. You may not have seen her on your screen in decades, but if you're a SpongeBob fan, her voice may sound just a little familiar. Don't you remember, silly? You promised me you'd own the Krusty Krab by my 90th birthday. Before we continue, be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. You have the option to be notified for occasional videos or all of them. If you're on your phone, make sure you go into your settings and switch on notifications. Number 1. Joe Piscopo Even though Eddie Murphy dominated SNL in the early 80s, there was one person who held his ground and still shone in that era, and that was Joe Piscopo. You are aptly named. <laughs> Like I said many times, you are truly a wonder. Thanks a lot, Frank. One of only two cast members who were retained after Gene Domanian was fired from the show, the other being Murphy, Piscopo had several well-done impressions under his belt, most notably Frank Sinatra and David Letterman. My, oh my, what a fine show we've slapped together for you folks here tonight. So uh, wake the kids, phone the neighbors, come in from the lawn. This is one you won't want to miss. <laughs> After leaving SNL in 1984, Piscopo starred in the crime comedy film Johnny Dangerously, which received mixed reviews and did little or nothing to propel his budding career. I always wondered what happened to you. Well, I fulfilled a lot of people's predictions about me. I've become a real scumbag. Since then, he's appeared in a few minor TV roles, stand-up specials, and in 2017, considered a run for governor of New Jersey. So there's that. Do you agree with our picks? Check out this other recent clip from WatchMojo, and be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified about our latest videos.